Alan Reid could as easily have served on the parliamentary benches as reported about them from the gallery. But he was, and was till his death, deeply suspicious of the corrupting nature of power. I will buy more people with the offer of power than ever I'll buy with money. And I know myself on the brief occasions when I've enjoyed some little power, it has affected me and affected me adversely. Inevitably though, over such a long career, the line between pressman and politician did become blurred. As doyen of the gallery, politicians valued his judgment. I suppose after you've been around for a long time, a lot of people do ask your advice. You've mostly seen what happens in the place happen before, and they ask your advice. And what I try and do is to give the advice honestly from their viewpoint, not from my viewpoint, but from their viewpoint. And uh, often the advice is against my own narrow self-interest as a newspaper man. The 36 Faceless Men was the story which, depending on your politics, was Alan Reid's worst or finest hour. It was April 1963. Inside a Canberra hotel, 36 members of the ALP Federal Conference were deciding Labor's stance on national security. Incredible as it now sounds, under Labor's constitution, its parliamentary leaders had no voice in policy making. The pictures Alan Reid commissioned brought this home to many Australians for the first time. He told the story of those pictures to Jock Rankin in 1982. I was sitting right in this seat and there were a row of pressmen along here like a lot of hungry crows. And I look over there at the reception there. I see Arthur Cornwall's Commonwealth car driver standing there. And there was an aged bloke sitting next to me like you were sitting there and I gave him a nudge. I said, don't do anything violent. I said, but walk outside, you'll find Arthur Corwell there. Well, he got up very quietly and said, okay, have a breath of air and walked outside. And when he came back, his eyes were out on sticks and he sat down beside me and said very quietly, he said, not only Arthur Corwell's out there, he said, Gough Whitlam's out there and he's conferring with people like Chamberlain and others under the street lamp out there. I got on the phone to David Berman, who was then the editor of the Canberra Times. I said, David, I want a photographer. He said, they've all gone home. I said, I don't care, get one back, do anything, get one back. He said, can't do it, Alan. So I came back and I'm sitting here very disconsolately. And all of a sudden, a bloke comes out of that room there, which was then a lounge. And I knew, I also knew he was a very good amateur photographer. I said, that will be history in the making, my friend. And it was. Afterwards, the ALP changed its rules to include parliamentary leaders in policy meetings. He was something of a bait noir in the Labor Party because when they were going through bad times and often we were our own worst enemies, in those circumstances there's a tendency to blame others and so Alan wasn't too well liked. Hawke's assessment was mild. In the mid-50s, others in the ALP refused to renew Reid's party membership. Reid put it down to knowing too much and writing too much about the party. To me, the ALP has always been the dynamic whether of Australian politics, whether in government or in opposition. It's been the one that's produced the new thought and so on. And I suppose another factor in it too was the party to which I belonged for some years as a younger man until a fellow was as with some of the chieftains in the ALP. And consequently, I had an interest in that, a much deeper interest in that, and its machinations and movements than ever I had in the Liberals. Reed's reputation lay in his uncanny knowledge of what was really going on in the smoke-filled back rooms of politics. How are you, comrade? Long time no see. What's news in the big wicked world? It was Reid who revealed B.A. Santa Maria's anti-communist white anting of the Victorian ALP. If the faceless men was his most sensational story, this was his most important. It led to the disastrous split in the party, the split that gave birth to the Democratic Labour Party and consigned the ALP to the political wilderness for 17 years. Born in England in 1914, Alan Reid emigrated to Australia at the age of 11 with his parents and two sisters. 
His father taught him to read and write from Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. In those days, before free education, he put himself through school on bursaries, graduating from Waverley College in 1931, the height of the Depression and dole queues. I can remember how rotten I felt about it and the way in which unemployment saps your morale. And I went bush for a while and, you know, you'd pick up an odd day here and an odd day there. I dug drains down at, uh, in the Riverina and uh, I did a bit of rabbiting and a bit of fencing and that type of stuff. And then I came back to town. Back in town, Reed fluked a job on a newspaper. Don't ask me how, how it happened. But I got in to see Robert Clyde Packer, who was then the managing editor of Associated Newspapers Limited. And I can, to this day, remember what he said to me. He said, boy, he said, if I put all the applications for cadet chips together, I'd reach from here down to Circular Quay. He said, but I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'll give you a job as a copy boy. So began his career in journalism. From his artificially lofty perch in the press gallery, Reid chronicled five decades of Australian politics the triumphs and traumas of 15 Prime Ministers. But Reed's long association with the Packer family's Australian Consolidated Press, which staunchly supported Menzies, was seen by some as a blot on his journalistic detachment. His critics claimed he was simply Sir Frank Packer's emissary. It's inaccurate because I've never been asked to put forward his views. The views I have expressed, they might be wrong, so on. the views I've always expressed have been reads and Sir Frank quite often didn't agree with them. Nevertheless, when the 1961 election looked like being a cliffhanger, it was Reed who was chosen by Sir Frank to read Menzies, the political riot act. Sir Frank didn't phone me. He called me in and asked me, and I said Labour would win. And he asked me if there's anything could prevent that, and I said, oh, I suppose. I said, if Menzies gave an assurance, that he would restore full employment within a specific time. He said, have you told Menzies so? I said, no. He said, well, I'm giving you an instruction as an employer. He said, go down and tell him so. He picked up the phone and he rang Menzies and said, I'm sending Alan down with instructions to say something to you. I'd like you to listen to him. So I went down and saw Menzies. I said this. And then within 24 hours, the pledge of restoration of full employment emerged. I think if he hadn't said it, he'd have gone down. As it was, he won very narrowly. If Reid was credited with making Prime Ministers, he was also suspected of unmaking them. In 1971, when Malcolm Fraser resigned as Defence Minister, precipitating the fall of Prime Minister John Gorton, his action was almost a carbon copy of what Reid had written the day before in the Sunday Telegraph. Reid later wrote in his book, The Gorton Experiment, that Fraser had been counselled on this course. Many Canberra insiders believed it was Reid's advice. He never denied this. You said that Mr Fraser was taking advice and you knew that he'd made the decision to resign as early as Saturday. Did you know who he was taking advice from? Yes. Could I ask you whether he was taking advice from you and if he was, whether that advice was consistent with the position that you outlined in the Telegraph and in Meet the Press? That's a real toe biter. I uh, can't answer it, Your Honour. But the old Red Fox, as Reed was known, was not always a creature of politics and Parliament. His time in the bush during the Depression gave him an abiding love of the Australian countryside. But if you stay around Canberra too long, it's a terribly artificial life. And I think you've got to get away from it every so often to get back in touch with reality, with men who work with their hands and who work to produce things. And there was Alan Reid, the author. Apart from his three major political works, The Power Struggle, The Gorton Experiment and The Whitlam Venture, he also dabbled in fiction writing potboilers for the American market under a pseudonym. Alan Reed married his wife Joan 47 years ago. They were totally devoted to one another. He writing her a sonnet every birthday, she nursing the frustrations of a frail body, but acute and active mind through his last years. Alan Reed, a wonderful friend to all of us here on Sunday and of course to many others.